let's, um, let's kind of get everybody acquainted with what qualifies you to be up here in, in the heat. Because <laughs> um, I don't know. These, these guys could be imposters. So um, let's kind of go down the line. We'll start with Charlie. We'll go down to Brian. And uh, give a little sort of elevator pitch for your implementation, your milieu, if you will. Charlie. All right. Uh, Charlie, Charles Oliver Nutter, you can call me Charlie, you're all my friends. Uh, I've been working on JRuby now for about seven years or so, uh, trying to make sure we, we try to build the best Ruby possible on the JVM, um, try to make the JVM fit for Ruby, and uh, hopefully some of you have been able to, to try it and, and get some benefit from it. Monsieur Laurent. Mm. Bonsoir. <laughs> <laughs> mm, bonsoir. So, uh, so my name is uh, Laurent, and I'm the only French speaker here, native <laughs> French speaker. Yeah. And I... Do you want to speak in French the whole time, then? That could be a really interesting panel. Oh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. I could, I, could, I could actually lie a lot, then. Just you can really answer. Able. You can do both, and we won't know what you're saying. You exactly, could just basically, yeah. like, one-up us the whole time. I could say shit, and you wouldn't That's yes, right. <laughs> <laughs> you could just swear up and down. We would say, this guy's smart. Yeah. <laughs> so where, why are you here? So uh, I... Hmm. So... Uh, <laughs> he's, he's had too much saucy song already, I no, think. No, no, I, so I, I, I work on, a, I actually I created um, an implementation of Ruby called Mac Ruby uh, back in 2006, 2006, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. I used to work at Apple then. And Mac Ruby uh, was an implementation of Ruby uh, built on top of core OS 10 technologies. And it was, first it started like a fork of one night and we, we actually, uh, it, it, it became a full uh, implementation of Ruby and recently I, created Ruby Motion, which is a new implementation of Ruby again, based on Mac Ruby. It's actually not a true implementation of Ruby, but I might perhaps describe that later. Okay. Yeah, we, I mean, we can, go, we, can, we can get into that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Monsieur Patterson. Uh, go ahead. Hi. <laughs> My name is Aaron. Most people call me Tenderlove. I am qualified to be here today because I have this doctor's jacket on. Yeah. This is why I can be here. Um, of course. I'm, I'm on the Ruby core team. I am representing MRI. Uh, I've been on the Ruby core team for, uh, I don't know, um, three or four years, I think. I'm not sure. Um, anyway, yes, I'm here to talk about Matt's Ruby. Um, that's it. Okay. <laughs> Brian? Um, so I'm here. It's all Evan's fault. He, uh, <laughs> He wrote a post uh, on uh, adding continuations to Rubinius uh, in 2006. And uh, <clears throat> I was always interested in a uh, more modern virtual machine. At that time, Ruby 1.8.4, I think, was out. So uh, he was, wrote the continuations in Ruby, and he was test driving the instruction set. So I was all in, and I've uh, been working on it since then. Rubinius. Rubinius, about. yes. I'm going to talk about any of my other amazing creations, like, I don't know, the, my new relic gem or something like that. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So, um, you know, I, I think that the audience can probably um, understand this sentiment, but why would you go out and make a new implementation? It seems hard. I mean, it seems like kind of, aren't there, there's a lot of these uh, implementations out there. Why can't we use one of those? So, um, you know, we could, why don't we, we'll, we'll go back the other way. Um, so, you know, why do you guys feel like, you know, we've got these other Ruby implementations and, and, and you know, kind of maybe speak to that, you know, you can, again, this is kind of the, the point in the panel where we can start getting into discussions and things like that. So if you have something you want to say, you can just pipe right in and we'll, I'll moderate as I need to moderate, but otherwise I'll kind of let you guys talk. But we'll go ahead and, sort of start with comments with Brian. Sure. So uh, if, you, if you look at Lisp, for instance, one of, the, one of the sayings out there is that by the time you get your CS degree, you've, you've written a Lisp. So there's you know, however many hundreds of thousands of Lisps out there. I think it would be amazing if uh, there were that many Ruby implementations. So on the one hand, I don't think a Ruby implementation, multiple of them uh, are bad. 
What drew me to Rubinius uh, was simply wanting a, a more modern virtual machine, a bytecode virtual machine. And again, this was back when MRI was uh, basically, it was quite old, an old technology. Uh, I wanted to have good concurrency and a better virtual machine. And um, following languages like Lisp and Smalltalk, I wanted to implement more of things in Ruby. I started, the first language that I was paid to write programs in was C, so I was comfortable with C, but I did not like writing C. So the thing that attracted me to Rubinius was the idea that we would, we would use a lot of Ruby, uh, and we do. So that, that's why I was interested in it, and, and why I think more implementations are better, a good thing, not a bad thing. I mean, Aaron, you could, I know you didn't start MRI. You were no. living in Japan in 1993, as did far you? as I understand. <laughs> I, no, I didn't. I, I like but you could speak about it maybe from the Rails side of things, you know, like kind of think maybe is any, any thoughts there? Well, I like, so I like hacking on MRI because I like to write C, but I hate myself. I'm actually dead inside. I don't know if you know that. <laughs> it's true. I'm, That's why I'm he actually, does a lot of hugs. I'm dead inside. I like C code. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I, I actually like writing and programming in C, so hacking on MRI is fun for me. Um, I don't know about a Rails perspective. OK, that's fine. I, 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 just, I, I was giving you an opening. Are you rewriting Rails in C? Uh, no, I'm rewriting uh, Ruby in Rails. It's going to be just the Oribus just yeah. eating its pretty amazing. For, it's pretty amazing. You install Ruby, and you get uh, Turbo Links. I agree. <laughs> I, I have to agree now you're dead inside. <laughs> Active support GC. Yes. <laughs> uh, Laurent, having written t two implementations now, I mean, how did you how did you get started? Kind of, you know, like yeah. stuff like that. So yeah, so the reason behind Ruby Motion is probably the same reason behind Mac Ruby. When uh, when when I did Mac Ruby, uh, it was at a point where so before doing Mac Ruby, I worked on Ruby Coco. And the idea has always been to write native applications in Ruby, native Mac applications in Ruby. So uh, being able to, to write full-fledged applications for your Mac. And I started working on Ruby Coco, and I, I actually rewrote most of the, um, the project. And Ruby Coco was a framework between uh, MRI, CRuby, not sure how it's called these days, and the Objective-C runtime. And there was, there was this thing called Ruby Coco right in the middle. It was doing all the translation between both runtimes. And it was extremely slow, and it was very hard to maintain. It was very hard to keep track. Because you know, a bridge has to keep track of the, the object model of both sides. So we need to make sure that we create proxies and forward messages and whatever. It, was, it wasn't very efficient. So the reason behind MicroBee was really to get rid of the, the bridge and make sure that we have just, a, just one runtime. And we started by actually taking Ruby 1.9, C Ruby 1.9, and forking the project. And we changed the syntax. We actually started to rewrite parts of the code base. And eventually, uh, um, over, the, over the years, we actually rewrote most, actually, we only have the parser now, the .y file that we were talking before. So everything else has been rewritten. And, and yeah, and Ruby Motion is just this code base that has been ported to uh, iOS. I'm gonna interject here. I'm gonna get. I'm. I'm also sort of. Uh, I'm sort of a proxy for the audience here. So sometimes I'll ask really nerdy questions, and I'm sorry if it's too nerdy, but tough. I've got the mic. Um, do you think the hardest thing in the like the biggest thing where you were like, okay, I can't continue with Roby Coco was like pro ident proxy identity? So in other words, like you know, you want to make sure that. The, I, the object that you're proxying, the Objective-C side, that you have the same one on the Ruby side because you could add instance variables and all that kind of yeah. stuff? Yeah. So there were, so actually, for, uh, to make sure I couldn't use Ruby Coco, I actually tried to write something in it. Uh -huh. I tried to write a, a text editor. I mean, we pretty much every, every, yeah. The, 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 every, the first, every, the first every one, right? Yeah. Every programmer does a Lisp and a text editor eventually. Yep. And, uh, and it was very slow. I actually wrote a Ruby text editor in Ruby Coco, and I tried to colorize the syntax, and it was very slow. Then I started to figure out it was due to the fact that we would have to use, so I was even using libffi to forward messages. Before, we were using the NS object invocation stack, which was super slow, and then we switched to libffi, which was a bit faster, but it was still uh, maybe an order of magnitude slower than doing the same thing in Objective-C. And then we have all the objects that have to be converted. 
Like when you, pa when, when you pass strings and arrays, it really, we have to create the Objective C equivalent and then convert it back. And, oh. and but that, that's just the runtime thing, that's just from a user perspective. From a, a developer perspective, Ruby Coco was a nightmare to maintain because it was a very, very complex piece of software. Oh. It was, we had, so to make, to make things efficient, we had to, we had to keep, uh, we, had, we had to maintain caches. You know, to maintain proxies because we don't want to create a pro we don't want to create the proxies every time, right? So we want to cache them, and invalidating the caches was the hardest thing. Gotcha. That's a good so that's a good segue for you, Charlie. Because you know, JRuby obviously a big part of it is that interplay right. between what else goes on inside the JVM. Right, right. MacRuby and JRuby are, are kind of brothers in that sense. Um, it's the idea that we have a language we love, Ruby and a platform with capabilities that we want to expose to Ruby. Mm -hmm. And that's what JRuby is. It's taking the JVM, probably the most robust, the most mature managed runtime out there, uh, all of the libraries and languages that are available on the JVM, and making that all accessible to a compatible Ruby implementation. Uh, I didn't start JRuby, but in 2004, when I was first exposed to Ruby, uh, went to RubyConf that year without knowing the language and fell in love with it, uh, my first thought was, wow, this is an awesome language. It would be great if I could use this language with this runtime and this platform that I know that has threading and garbage collection and all this stuff that's well beyond the, the standard implementation. So that was how I got into it and why I've worked on JRuby. Uh, I've had a number of people ask, how have you managed to continue working on JRuby for seven years full time. And actually, a year before that, I was working 40 to 60 hours of my own time on JRuby in addition to my regular job. And I think it's because it, over the years, I've found more and more interesting things to learn about uh, implementing software, implementing uh, runtimes, implementing stuff on the JVM. Like uh, I was talking last night about, or earlier today, about non blocking IO and how I've had to learn all of the intricacies of how to do non-blocking I.O., how it works on different platforms, how it works on the JVM. And so for, for my goal with JRuby is also to learn about all these different areas of software development, libraries, and other things while building the best Ruby possible. Uh, so how did you, so you didn't start JRuby. Did you, I know that, did Chad Fowler start it? Or did, uh, did you just kind of see it and pick it up? Was it dormant at the time? So the original developer that came up with it was, uh, his name was Jan Arne Peterson. Uh, he's disappeared for the most part. I think Tom met him once at JRubyConf Europe last year. Uh, but for the most part, we've never seen him or talked to him anymore. Uh, but he came up with, uh, at first, just the parser, getting a, por a port of the parser in the AST, continuing on to building JRuby in 2001 or so. Uh, various folks have contributed over the years. Chad Fowler has some early commits in it. Um, of course, Tom Annabo came in in about 2002, 2003, and when I was actually at RubyConf 2004, I was so stricken with the language and how nice it was that my first thought, being a guy that worked in a Java organization, was I wonder if there's some sort of JRuby thing <laughs> out there. And so I looked it up, I Googled, and found that there was a project out there, in, it actually was moving forward, uh, and that Tom Annabo, the other JRuby lead, was uh, running the project I had worked with him four or five years earlier at the university, so I already knew him. It was just this magical co conflux of things that brought me to Ruby, me to JRuby, and then everything that's happened since then. I have to take a tangent, because we have to talk about my favorite piece of Charlie Nutter trivia. What piece of software did you work on in the mid-90s, Charlie? Uh, I was actually lead on a project called Lightstep. Yes! <laughs> in the mid-90s, does anybody here no light step. Do yeah, everybody remember run. light step? There's okay. one. Okay, There's who, was a couple. A, who was a power Windows user in the mid 90s? Nobody? What did you guys, you, you weren't all using Minitel in the mid 90s. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that's awesome to see that there's still some light steppers around. Okay. Yeah, I took over light step in 95 or 6 or so. Um, and did basically a complete rewrite of it to componentize it. But yeah, it was, my it was my, first, my first exposure to open This is my favorite piece of trivia, only because I remember like, trying to trick out my Windows machine in the mid-90s, and be like, this light step thing's amazing. How do I run a new shell? And 
And then when I found out Charlie was like the lead developer, it totally blew my mind. So I just <laughs> I love bringing that up. For those of you who don't know, LightStep basically was to replace the entire Explorer desktop with like a step the whole, desktop. The whole, the whole thing. thing. The whole the whole kit and caboodle. That's American. And it had a whole like plug-in everything. system and everything. And yeah, it was it was an adventure. My, so my, dope. My years of working in Win32 are, yeah. are long past me <laughs> now, thank goodness. But. OK, well, we'll get back to the thing at hand. I just love to bring that up. Um, the, OK, what so. What does the J stand for in JRuby? <laughs> <laughs> what does the J stand for? It stands for joy, really. <laughs> there we go. Because <laughs> that's what we're trying to bring to everyone, joy in running Ruby. Actually, the funny thing with the J, uh, most European countries will pronounce it yay Ruby, yeah. which I think is awesome, because it's yay Ruby. And that's exactly what I want to get across. So slowly we're getting the other implications of the J out of people's minds. <laughs> well, I, and I like that. I, you've, could you have a, the J on this shirt? I don't know. But the, but there's a the logo was redone with an actual J. Like oh a, yeah. A, a, the bird. The bird. Yeah. The bird. No, we don't and, have the bird. J, this is the J J A Y bird. Anyway. Yep. Yep. Um, that was sort of we kind of that was a good retcon in a way into the exactly the, to get something else on people's minds right, about right. the J. Oh, it's the bird ruby. Yeah, That's all right. I bird, that. bird ruby. They must use that at Twitter. Yeah. yeah okay. Exactly. So, it's perfect. Yeah, exactly. So you just got to work it up, work it up. Um, okay. So um, we're, we'll get a little sour, not really sour, but like kind of talk about some more serious things. So, you know, I think that we're all, you know, we see companies pick up, diff, pick up uh, different languages all the time, you know, Ruby. Uh, you know, I think Steve talked about it earlier. You know, there's not a Y Combinator um, startup now that's like, our big thing is that we're using Ruby. It's sort of the safe bet, right? And I think that kind of, that can worry some people, especially the people who've been sort of the early adopters. Like, oh, you know, is it, is it, you know, the, uh, not is it dying, but sort of a language has these sort of ebbs and flows. So I, I, this is going to be open. I'm not going to go down the road. But do you guys have any thoughts on, you know, like, what, what does Ruby need to do to stay relevant for companies and for you know, individual developers, you know, mind share amongst early adopters, that kind of thing? Any thoughts? Mm. I mean, I think Laurent, obviously, Ruby Motion is this very sort of, I, what, I, I'll what, call it a niche. That's maybe not yeah. the best word to say. But. What's actually very interesting in Ruby Motion is that we get a lot of users from other uh, language communities. There are actually people learning Ruby just to use Ruby Motion. Many people from Python and JavaScript communities, mm. especially, because there is no, no such thing as Pi motion, <laughs> GS motion, motion, or whatever. Yeah. Right. So, right. so it actually brings people to the community. Yeah. Right. And well, the diversity is, is one of the big things that, that having many implementations uh, improves as far as Ruby. Having the option of using Ruby, but still being able to use the JVM and the libraries that you're used to there has opened it up to a tremendous number of organizations. There's organizations that would never have considered Ruby before that are now using it as the front end for their Java, Scala, Clojure, whatever applications. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of folks that left Ruby to use Scala or Clojure have come sort of halfway back to use JRuby and Rails since they couldn't find something that worked as nicely for them in the Scala or Clojure communities. So having JRuby as an option is improving uh, uh, the perception in the world and, and making it easier for people to stick around and stay on the platform. Yeah, you know, I think that um, it, it almost seems like maybe, you know, early on when we were all working on these uh, different Ruby implementations, people were, were worried about sort of fragmentation. And in a way, the different implementations maybe are sort of buffering Ruby from other things now because it's, you know, it's sort of has a wider base and that wider base allows it to stay stay relevant. Right. Well, I think, it, I think it helps us explore new stuff. I mean, having different implementations lets us bring more diversity, and I think having that, diverse, having that diversity will push us forward. Mm -hmm. Like, if any of us happen to discover something that's more super awesome, then right. we can fold that into the language and push forward. Yeah, yeah we've, we've, never, we've never tried to sell JRuby as just an automatic replacement for MRI. And even today, we don't say, you know, everybody should switch from MRI to JRuby. Uh, the reason that you would switch to JRuby is if you need something that JRuby provides that MRI doesn't. Maybe it's a concurrency, maybe it's big data GC kind of things, uh, maybe it's just JVM libraries, JVM deployment models. Uh, I, I've never really seen that the, the many implementations, I, I, as one of the implementers, I've never seen it as being fragmentary. 
Yeah. I've seen it as I'm trying to give this to the Ruby community as another option. Uh, sure. Or give it to the wider developer community as a, as a way of getting into Ruby when they might not otherwise be able to. So I, I think it, by continuing the, the exploration that we're doing on all the implementations, uh, collaboration. I mean, I, I'm an MRI committer. And I've actually committed fixes and, and other stuff to C Ruby. Uh, and I'm working on a number of issues uh, right now. Uh, we're raising all boats by doing our own implementation and then feeding stuff back into the Ruby itself. Yeah. I think the main question was probably what can Ruby do better to get more sure, into Sure, yeah, the absolutely. Companies? Yeah, right. I mean, yeah, you could definitely spin it. You can you look mm -hmm. at the question that way. What things could, what things, you know, I kind of have that somewhere on my list of whatevers. Oops. Um, no, 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 it's fine. Um, you know, like what kind of features, what kind of, like, and sort of what can it do to stay relevant? You know, certainly things like new platforms, you know, and looking at like iOS platforms yeah. as a way to stay relevant. You know, any other thoughts, Brian? You haven't really chimed in on this one. Well, I think, I think um, <clears throat> Ruby Motion and Mac Ruby before that is very interesting because uh, at the time that Laurent was doing Mac Ruby, uh, I started working on Rubinius and started Ruby Spec. And um, I think Alloy, did a lot of work initially to try to get yeah. Mac yeah. Ruby running on Ruby spec. Yeah, yeah, we actually at one point we were actually full of full of, full full time on Ruby spec. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, so the the purpose of Ruby spec was to try to keep Unity in the language. But the thing that I that I didn't uh, fully appreciate at the time, and I think uh, is much more significant to me now, is understanding that. In, uh, especially in open source, we tend to have a very social perspective on it. And uh, when you look at actual product development, uh, markets and market segments are very important. So obviously Coke and Pepsi are two soft drinks, but most people have a preference if they drink one of the two. And there's not a lot of people who go from one to the other. And the, the thing that I didn't actually appreciate enough about MacRuby and Ruby Motion makes very obvious is that for a certain segment of people, they really need this tool. And that's why I think you see people coming from other languages and, and learning it because it gives them probably a much better experience than Objective-C for writing iOS apps. Yep. And so I think it's very interesting to consider that from the, the standpoint of open source software that recognizing that segments can exist, and, and people like we were discussing last night are probably not trying to run Rails on, on Ruby Motion. I hope so. <laughs> yeah, right? I so think I've it's a, a natural issues. segment. I'm yeah. not, I'm not sure. I couldn't get it running. You should, you should probably try, actually. Yeah. Actually, with the new iPhone, I mean, it's very fast. So. Ah, yes, yes. <laughs> I'll be running Rails All on the iPhone. All your cores. Maybe it can scale now. Yeah, Turbo can, apps. <laughs> Rails can scale. Turbo, Turbo apps, apps, yeah. <laughs> Turbo motion. Yes, Turbo motion. 64, 64 yeah. bit range. But so, you know, Brian, do you have any, you know, I know that you've done some stuff recently with, you know, kind of looking at Rubini's is that a, Is that a leading question, Evan? <laughs> <laughs> Never. Uh, you know, like, what, what are the kind of things that you think, you know, that, you know, Ruby can do to, to stay relevant, to make sure that, you know, it still has mind share amongst those developers that, you know, bring, the, incubate ideas in companies. Right. That, I mean, that's always the worry. Is that yep. you know if it becomes the safe too much of the safe choice, it just it'll be the safe choice. It won't be the thing that's kind of pushing things forward anymore. Well, I, I think the, I think there's no such thing as a safe choice anymore because the world is changing so rapidly. Uh, Eric's talk about the uh, acceleration of technology. Uh, we're certainly not going to wait 95,000 years for the next uh, big thing. And I think right now the most interesting thing is that there's not a single computer. First of all, like your iPhone. One iPhone has more computing power than all of the computers in 1950 or something like that, and we have hundreds of millions of these smartphones. And there's not a single computer in the world that's doing interesting things without talking to at least one other computer. Uh, and so as soon as you start talking to the other computers, you've got latency and, and possible network partitions and these sort of things. So I think that right now, for writing applications, concurrency and distributed uh, application architectures are fundamental. And so one of the things that concerns me is, is not that you know, Ruby is the default choice so everybody's happy. I don't think that's really the case. I think that in some places it's the case. But just like the, the market segmentation that we we're looking at with Ruby Motion, um, there are certainly people who are trying to do things and finding Ruby insufficient. And not insufficient because the language is necessarily lacking, but, but, but because we can't uh, utilize hardware uh, efficiently, perhaps, or, or we can't write a distributed application well. 
So that's what concerns me. I don't like to see people go to go or closure um, simply because they couldn't do something in Ruby. If they want to write in Ruby, then I would like them to be able to write in Ruby. So that's why I think it's important yeah. for us to innovate and, and challenge that. The other thing is, we always need to validate our assumptions. It's easy for us to have the idea that we know what we're doing. And when someone else, if you never question that, you never ask somebody else, then um, you might just continue thinking what you know what you're doing and you don't. Okay. Um, so we'll kind of move on to the next thing. Do we, mean, do we mean relevant or do we mean hip? Well, I think that, well, it's a good I, I'm, this is a serious question. No, absolutely. That's, totally a, that's a really great question. And, and, and um, I've, I've had this conversation with, with a few people and I'm over the, you know, the course of the last few months. I mean, relevant, okay, let's define them for a moment. So many things, so many problems in human communication come down to a vocabulary issue. So, I mean, I would say hip is sort of this idea that those early adopters um, are the people who are talking about it. You have these like uh, very organic evangelists is probably what would you, you would call hip, right? Um, relevant is probably whether or not you see uh, companies look to this technology as their, something that they're going to bet on. Something that they're going to say, you know, like when they started, it, they're gonna start a new project, let's do it in Ruby. In that way, Ruby would be relevant, right? And I think that um, they're related, right? And I think that some people would say like, uh, the, the people who think technologies are hip um, bring technologies into companies and sort of incubate them for a while and then they become relevant. I mean, what do you guys think? I don't wanna, this isn't my, I don't wanna just talk up here, but. I don't know, I mean, I, like, I see a lot of people like, oh, rah, 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 I'm using, I don't know, whatever, some new. Node.js. Yes, I'm using Node.js, <laughs> exactly. It's got, <laughs> it's got callbacks, so it must, it's got callbacks in async, so it must scale. Web scale. Um, <laughs> And I can't tell, like, it's very difficult to tell. Like, I think people think, oh, this is, I see so many people talking about it. It must be relevant when actually, nah, it's just, it's, yeah. it's hip. I mean, Ruby I was think, hip. I think, you know, we're, um, isn't it still hip? We are I'm pretty hip. I got my skinny jeans. Are these skinny jeans? Super, <laughs> not, 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 not in France. Not ah, okay. Jeans. Those jeans. are really baggy in France. And I'm wearing, b b you know, banana. I right. promise I have skinny jeans at home. Okay. Once, anyway. I, once I'm done with this diet. All right. Um, so um, you don't want to see me in skinny jeans today. Now I forgot what I was going to say. I'm just picturing Aaron in skinny jeans. Uh, anyway, um, well, so we've had we've tr we've constantly fought against the the question of how to make uh, on a smaller scale JRuby be both relevant and hip, and you know like the almost unhip platform possible that we've now put Ruby on and try to get Rubyists, who are the hippest programmers in the world. I mean, <laughs> you only use the coolest stuff ever. Snap, and so like JRuby is not something that usually enters into a typical Rubyist mind as being the hippest, coolest new thing. I'm gonna use JRuby because I'm awesome and yeah, I'm Yeah, but cool. Closure's hip. Yeah, but Closure's hip, See, that, that drives us nuts. <laughs> <laughs> like, what, like Closure is the coolest thing I in the world. As parenthesis. Exactly, exactly. As parenthesis. It's Mott's yeah, it's, fault it's, he made parenthesis. Parentheses optional. Closure yeah. came in. They have parentheses. Yeah. They're hip. That's well, I, well I, I mean, I mean, but part of being part of being hip is usually, and I'll borrow from our modern vernacular for a moment, if you will, uh, being hip, being a hipster, if you were, is. No, but I mean, part of it is is sort of relishing obscurity, a, a degree of obscurity, right? And as Ruby has become more relevant, it's become less hip because it's not as obscure. It's not, the, it's not the band that no one's ever heard of that you're, only you listen to. Sorry, that's, that's a sort of a thing that people do. If, I don't know, anyway. Um, You've never heard of them. I'm trying to like them. bring, I don't know how, <laughs> this, is the, this is the very American in me trying to be like, I don't know if the French audience knows what I'm talking about. I better bring, I, yeah, never mind. So excuse my potential patronizing tone for a moment. Um, but yeah, so I kind of wonder if maybe that's, I mean, what do you, is that maybe kind of what we're looking at here? As Ruby has become bigger, it's become less obscure? I don't think that it's anything to do with hip. I mean, JavaScript's not hip. It's probably the most used language in the world because it gives people the ability to do something that they need to do. And I think that, JavaScript's like, not hip? No. Uh, <laughs> what? 
<laughs> have you been I'm sorry to be the one to break it. Have you read Hacker News? <laughs> Where, but, but, no one dance? <laughs> well, but, I, but I think that my, my question, I, I think my, you know, my original question kind of maybe speaks to that, right? You have these ebbs and flow. And JavaScript's been around for quite a while now. And certainly, if you were to ask people in 1986 if JavaScript was hip, they would say, absolutely not. You know, so it's time for never to come again. <laughs> yeah. Well, but well, I just hip on the server now. That's the new thing. Yeah. Right. Like the like, you know, three or four years ago, you're writing your server JavaScript. What <laughs> What does that even mean? I don't even understand what that is. Yeah. So yeah, it was totally irrelevant. You then. You can get but, fired for writing it and like using Rhino or something, which is a JavaScript. Yeah, exactly. Well, like on the like server. six years ago, there was a guy at Sun who built an entire like Railsy web framework that was all JavaScript based, and it was actually pretty cool. It was all pluggable. It was super fast. And it was it was pre hip. I was mean, it was FX? it was so early, way pre too hip. early. <laughs> and then like three years later, he's got to be like just it's like African his head death metal. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like African. So you guys death. don't even know know about that yet. See, that's how hip it is. Yeah. See, so yeah, I mean, JavaScript came out of nowhere as a server side technology, largely because I mean, no, maybe maybe it's not that JavaScript is hip; it's that Node is hip. Right. And most most developers that that you're using Node now are writing Node applications. They're writing in Node, and you yeah. see that all the time because it's now synonymous. It's become the rails of JavaScript, which is which was the big turning point for Ruby to become hip. Yeah. It turned everything around because suddenly Ruby became this awesome server side language for writing web applications. Node came along, and suddenly JavaScript is this awesome language for writing server side web applications. Callbacks, big data, it's got it. Yeah, exactly. So it's got the async it. sauce. Are you going to rewrite <laughs> JavaScript in Node? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, now Hold you, hear, you heard it here, folks. Um, okay. What about th things that you're not your anything that you're not super keen on in those things? That's usually a question for the two guys on the end. But I'll. We'll... Uh, anything I'm not super keen on. Mm, no, uh, so two one actually two one. I'm really excited about. Um, uh, oh, what do you call it? The string. Oh, the string freeze. Frozen yeah, strings. Yeah, frozen strings. Yes, Th that's a good thing. Yeah. I'm very excited about that. Uh, though I guess we're up in the air with the exact syntax, whether it'll be an, uh, an f suffix or we'll just do compiler tricks to make dot freeze right. do this better. I suppose we should explain what this is. Uh, so in Ruby 2.1, you'll be able to put strings in your code that are immutable. And what that means is that we can use uh, tricks to just reuse the same string object over and over again, rather than every time you evaluate some string literal, you actually get a new, a new string object generated in your code. And this is like a huge uh, cause for garbage in your in your application when maybe we never even mutate that string. So you're still creating this garbage and you have to collect it. So we're excited about that. We'll be able to replace a lot of the weird constant hacks we have with just frozen string literals. So I'm excited about that. Um, what else? What were we, we talking go, we about? Can, we can go on. I don't L know. Laurent, any, uh, what, what version of Ruby does Mac Ruby or uh, uh, Ruby Motion? Ruby Motion? Well, it uh, that's a very good question. I think it's <laughs> I think it's one nine one technically, but we have feature, we actually started porting features from one nine three, and we have plans to support some stuff in two dot zero and two dot one. Okay. So yeah, so we are trying to. So Ruby Machine is a bit different from the other implementations in the sense that it's not a true implementation of Ruby. It's more like an, a dialect of mm -hmm. Ruby, because we remove stuff from Ruby and we added stuff. We added stuff to Ruby. Uh, what, what are those things that, you, that you've that you added that you that you like, that you wish the oh. other implementations had, maybe? Oh, well, I'm sure uh, Charles will agree on that, because in RubyMotion, I remove uh, proc binding. Mm, yeah, yeah, proc binding is a pain in the Proc Which binding is a, a feature that causes a lot of performance issues. Right. Yeah. And, but anyway, yeah. Um, yeah, RubyMotion is a bit different. So we don't, we don't have um, evil. Yeah. Evil with a string yeah. because, of course, we, don't, we cannot do just in time compilation on a device. Yeah. And there are many differences. But if we go back to Ruby 2.0 and 2.1, yeah. uh, what I really like in 2.1 is the new GC. And ah, yes. Koichi did a great job at um, providing a brand new generational GC. Um, and it's actually a great compromise because they want to keep compatibility with six extensions, which are absolutely not thread safe. And they, they had just, they, um, they just allocate variable uh, objects on the heap, and mm -hmm. 
it's so basically they, they are actually scanning extensions and they say this one uh, we can actually um, so the, the collector is actually very very smart and there is a presentation that you can find online I think that he did at Ruby Kagi and it was actually very interesting. You can put it right below him in the slides when this goes online right now. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> other other right than here. that. <laughs> For all of you at home. <laughs> and the frozen string also is very interesting. I wish uh, we could have that in RubyMotion because in RubyMotion, uh, I mean, especially on iOS, uh, memory is super, uh, it's, it's a big, big issue. So mm -hmm. it, I wish all literal strings were just imitable by default. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But back to Ruby 2.0, um, I feel like Ruby is growing too much. They are just adding too much features to it, like uh, main arguments and refinements. And I would prefer Ruby to be more minimalist and come back to the Lisp roots mm -hmm. and try to provide a more extensible object system and maybe a macro system. That's, that would be my Let us know when you design one and we'll, but I know uh, we'll take a look is, at it. Matt is absolutely not. Um, is going to a different direction, so. Yeah, yeah. I think I, I, I like some of the smaller additions that have come in in 2.0 and 2.1. Um, like the module prepending makes sense in a lot of cases when you really need to insert some logic just above the object but below its class. Uh, keyword arguments are good. I, actually, I, I argued a long time about having a required keyword argument syntax as well, and that is eventually going to be in uh, for 2.1. Um, I'm on the side of the refinements issue that I don't see the purpose of it. I don't like the feature particularly. Uh, but there are a lot of folks who do. Uh, what I'm glad in 2.0 was that we were able to get it turned on uh, only as a, an experimental feature. In 2.1, it's scaled way back after going. I've had lots of discussions with Shugo, with Mots, about what, what refinements needs to look like to at least avoid penalizing unrefined code. Is it? Uh, so Good. if there's people that want the feature, Great, you can go for it. There's performance things that are never going to be solved. They're not solvable, but everybody else doesn't have to care. And that's, so it's, it's not a feature that I like, it's not a feature for me, but we've done some work to make sure that it's in in a safe way. Is okay. it lexically scoped? It is, it is purely lexically scoped, yep. So it only affects the code where you're actually doing the refining. Oh good, so it's, it doesn't, every call site doesn't have right. to check, like it doesn't have am to I being refined? That was, that was the original yeah. problem. You could do a refinement in a piece of code that affected all the code in the hierarchy, uh, any blocks that were there, or, or any blocks that were passed in as procs, would, yeah. it, would, could be refined as well. It basically meant every call site in the system had to check for refinements every single time. Right. So It was, so, it was really uh, an absurd way to look right. at it. So it's a little weaker, it's really good, it's maybe a good tool for writing DSLs now, but perhaps it's not the, it's not a feature that you're gonna find that's local gonna affect patches. the whole right, code base. Right. So like, like local monkey patches. Yeah, so yeah like a local yeah. monkey patch within a file. Like, like the RSpec case was brought up a lot. Um, oh, I wanna just be able to have RSpec magically refine this top level namespace so that describe and other things don't really exist on object or kernel, but they're available for a spec. Well now what you could do with just the lexically scoped version is you say you're using RSpec at the top and then you get those refinements that come along with it. That makes so it's, it's a, it's a okay. decent compromise okay. uh, compared to the, the globally scoped, uh, unbounded uh, refinements that we had That's potentially in 2.0. Brian, any uh, Ruby so, 2021 stuff? Yeah, just to follow on, on that, interestingly, yeah. so the maintainer Myron Morstan, I think is his name, of, of uh, RSpec has made a plea to stop using RSpec as an example for refinements because they removed everything that could reasonably <laughs> use refinements. He's not a fan either. So he's officially just, he just shut it down. He's like, just please shut don't, it down. don't use RSpec as a reason for refinements. So it's not a good so, one. So, but I don't know, it's the only one I ever hear. Yeah. So they, Mathen, who oh. said that? Excuse Math my you French. Know, of course, Constantine. Fuck Mathen. You know the craziness. <laughs> <laughs> Mathen is another issue. Yeah, Mathen definitely it has, has. So issues. I've had, I've had a bug. It has issues forever. It has issues. <laughs> I've had a bug in, oh. in Ruby's tracker since like yeah, we 2006. Will, yeah, that Math Rubinius is just math, nightmarish on math, with Mathen. I mean, it, we, for those we, of you we, that we don't patch know, around it. But. Patch Mathen, around it. basically, when you load the library, it monkey patches fix num to return a different value for division. Not, not just a different object or a different representation, it yeah. is a different value because it then will return a rational object as a result rather than the inaccurate version that it would have before or a new, a, 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 the, uh, the integer version of it. So it changes irrational. the value it of a map. So <laughs> rational, I know. Good plan, man. Yeah. But you know, 
It's funny, and I, 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 I uh, one takeaway would be, I invite you to all go back and um, you can just go look at it on GitHub. Go look at the the um, the blame or even just the history of some of those standard lib files. You will be amazed. You'll be like, this was written during, this was written pre-Clinton. Like there are seriously some <laughs> crazy old files in there. Wait a no, no, no. First, first year of this term, Definitely I don't know. There's, like there's some 93, 94 yeah. code that's been totally unchanged. I think MathN was probably written in about 96. Um, yeah, but it's bananas. So it's a, it's a consequence of the fact that MRI was written as all the C code and this very thin layer of Ruby on top. So you can do the craziest things, right? You can take an object, remove every method from it, send the object to something, and it would magically be able to give you its representation as a string. How did it do that? It had no Ruby method. So when Rubenius started implementing everything in Ruby, people would take an object, remove all the methods, send it to something, and they'd get an exception. They'd be like, oh, what happened? Well, we had no methods to use. So yeah, yeah math and the, a lot of stuff, what, what distresses me about, um, and literally distresses me about uh, stuff like the frozen strings and the, the, uh, the math then and stuff like that is that their uh, refinements um, are attempts to work around problems in the language. And as we do that, we keep getting more and more levels of, of complexity. So with the encoding system, you can have one string literal come from one file that had one declared source encoding and a string literal will come from another file that had another declared source encoding. Somewhere in your code, you put those two together, you get an exception. On your web server, you get a 500. And I think that's a... Uh, I think it's not nice to make a programming language where there's little trap doors everywhere people can fall in. And I think refinements and frozen strings potentially and uh, encoding certainly are all areas where Ruby has made little trap doors that people can unwittingly fall into. Because if you have a frozen string literal coming from one file and you hand that out and somewhere else someone goes to append, what's gonna happen? It's frozen, you can't modify that. Or if you go, Hmm. We had a we had a bug in our in our Marshall code implemented in Ruby. Ruby 2.0 automatically makes in, uh, integers and floats and fixed nums frozen, and then taint is a no op. But if you try to taint a frozen object, it's going to raise an exception. And so we were getting these these objects that came through that were now frozen, and we tried to call taint on them. Of course, that was blowing up someone's code. And if you find Amos out here, he helped me de debug that over Twitter. So I don't, I don't know if you've been watching the frozen string conversation, but the latest thing that Charlie's been talking about is you actually have to call freeze on the string. So if you pass a frozen string off to something and somebody tries to append to it, you would get an exception, but that's yeah. but that's that's just that's, that was the just same way it's already. So yeah. the only, guess, like the change now is basically backed off from having a literal syntax for frozen strings to just turning a freeze call. So if someone chooses to freeze a string in their API, which a lot of APIs actually do freeze strings because they want to make sure that their the the keys in some cache somewhere or their values and that they're passing to another API don't get modified. It's no different than that. It changes nothing. It just says that the VMs now can make an optimization and say that this is always the same object everywhere. That, that assumes that freeze suddenly is special, that it's not going to yeah, change. Yeah, that, just, that, is that basically freeze. we're saying that a string, a, a, a quote string, marks, blah, 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 quote marks, a period, and then F-R-E, how do you spell freeze? Freeze. Mm -hmm. But that, that's the same as before. Uh, is, right? is magic now? Well, it's, see, that's the thing. Do you want, I don't know if we want to specify it, that it, if you do this, you're going to get the same object. It's more like taking the magic out of it and saying, okay, well, let's just implement the VM so that if it sees that it's a literal string with a freeze and freeze has not been replaced in some way, we can optimize it to always return the same yeah, object. That's, so there's no visible okay. difference that's to just, anybody other than the object IDs will be the same. That feels like a giant hack. Yeah. It's a giant hack. Uh, <laughs> I'll go ahead and name I it. Was, I want to ask a question right now. I love, doing these, I love doing these like when I'm in a... Wait, I want to say... I'm I sorry. I didn't I'm get sorry. to say what I liked about Ruby 2.0. Dr. Patterson. All right, Dr. Patterson. Esquire. No, I wanted to say why. So, have any of you guys actually used refinements? I tried. I wrote some of the first Ruby specs for it. Yeah. Um, I played with them. I so I converted Apple That's support cool. to use refinements. I've used them, and I have to say, let me tell you something I like about them. Um, since you have to put a constant in the file, you're actually referencing that. You're referencing that constant at compile time when you load the file up, right? Mm. So if you're not requiring that particular refinement, you can't, you, can't load that, you can't load that file. So if you don't have that refinement loaded, you're screwed. But today, like, if we're using, um, 
we have some class, so you have some class that depends on the, I don't know, some monkey patch like constantize or capitalize. Capitalize. That's not. Oh, no, that's, yeah, yeah. Uh, What's the one? Cam camelize. camelize. Yeah, camelize. let's camelize. say you have a yeah. file that has like camelize in it, uh, which today is a runtime dependency. So you could, you could actually load and eval that file, like load that file in, everything's super, you know, everything's fine. But as soon as you try to call methods on it, if you don't have that monkey patch loaded, you get an exception as soon as you call it. So you have a runtime, you have a runtime dependency where um, if you're using a refinement and you say, well, I actually want this, like I need to include, what was the method? Uh, camelize, I need to include this. Um, if you don't have that required when you eval a file, you get an exception earlier. Rather than at runtime, you get it at compile time. Sure. So that was the one, like the best thing I found about it. Um, though I have to say we'll probably not use them in Rails. Um, mainly because there was no way, like we can't convert all the monkey patches to refinements, mainly because there's no way to give backwards compatibility. So, I mean, we could probably use them internally, but I don't see a way to completely remove it. All right. Like, okay. All right, well, um, I think this is the time in the show where we'll ask for the house lights to come up and we'll see who has questions and we'll try and do a little stump implementer. So, so who's got a question for, for up here, yes. So, oh, sorry. So we can bring mics. So that the okay, so we're gonna bring some mics because we're, we're recording, so. Maybe, could, should we have them come up? Yeah, why don't we have, why don't we have you, you can be our first to, to come into our line. Oh, there's a, it, I, I have the mic. Oh my gosh. The microphone. I can't even see up here. <laughs> um, so my question uh, to all the implementers is, there's this property of programming language, uh, languages where they just sort of accrete features over mm -hmm. time. Um, C++ is probably the worst example of this. And um, I really hope that doesn't happen to Ruby, but in the new versions, I never see sort of old features or bad features being removed. And I guess my question to each of you is just, uh, if you could remove one feature from Ruby, uh, what would it be? Or, this or, isn't like, going to stump anybody. We're going to, uh, well, uh, well, <laughs> no one's, does uh, anybody, no, this is fine. We're going to answer this question and then we'll, we'll do that. Go ahead. Well, please, uh, Eric, continue. No, that, that's the basic question. If oh, you okay. were going to, like, just as an example. Just one feature? Huh. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's a hard question for both. Actually, first of all, it's, it's not so. Perl, JSUB, <laughs> function. Uh, so it's, example, not, it's not really true because there have been features that have been removed. There's a number of things yeah. that uh, early on when we were implementing JRuby, we realized that either they were just an absolute death for performance if you wanted to be able to build a performant runtime at some point, or that were security memory issues, like, like actual, actual critical problems, trap doors, like, like Brian described. Uh, so there have been some of those that have gone away over time. The, the, um, the best example of that is retry in a block. Which is exactly what I was thinking. The, yeah. You used to be able to do a retry in a block, and what it would do is it would go all the way back out to the original call, reevaluate the receiver code, reevaluate the argument code, reevaluate the block, and then call it again. And it was, it was only there because it was an accident of how MRI was implemented. But we got reports from people saying that you can't, we, that JRuby doesn't support this feature, and I argued and filed an issue and got Moss to actually remove it from the language because it didn't make sense anymore. And it was terribly dangerous to have a, a call downstream yeah. be able to cause you to reevaluate your line of code. Yeah. Um, so there, there have been cases where, where features have gone away. Um, and I'll, I'll think for a moment about, about things that I would remove too. Uh, obviously, the, like the pearlisms that Brian talks about, the, the, the special values, uh, dollar underscore, dollar tilde, dollar one, those are both implementation problems and nobody really knows how they work. Uh, they're sort of magic yeah. behind the who, scenes. Okay, who thinks those are thread scoped? You guys, come on. You know that I, I set you up for this. Global. Okay, so, so what, <laughs> all right, I'm not even gonna, you guys are playing with me. Hey. <laughs> Uh, Honestly, for me, yeah. if it would be a proc binding. Yeah. Proc binding. Proc so, because it's, you want to talk about uh, well, it? Well, I can just describe it so that people understand. So, yeah. so proc binding, uh, you can take any block uh, that's passed in, turn it into a proc object, and then eval code against whatever its binding scope was, um, which is not used very much. It's used in enough places where we haven't been able to get Mots and RubyCore to agree to remove it. The problem is that it means you need every block to have all possible 
local scope information available, regardless of whether you could have optimized it normally. Because someone might take that block, turn it into a proc downstream, and evaluate code against it. The thing is that if you have a piece of code that says, for example, x equal 1, then foo, and you pass a block, and then you actually evaluate the x local variable, you have no, I, there is no way to know the value of x. Right, so any, any library you pass a block into yeah. could basically change your local scope. So yeah, it, if, you hold, if you don't like this, please jump into the Ruby yeah. issue tracker and, and okay, let's, help us let's argue. Keep, let's keep going. For, so we can get to the fun stump part. Only one. One feature you Only would remove. Only one feature. Yeah, I wish there was much. This is good, we're gonna, we're gonna make Brian have to, have to give a short answer here. <laughs> <sighs> You I love like, it all. I love it's those. All, it, I love those global variables. You love man. them all. You're like a every every day. He's like Friday dude. hug with all the features. You no, know, you need to do when you when I need to do those one like command line one liner things like boom dollar underscore ah yeah oh, like yeah. <laughs> you do that stuff. I love that stuff. All right. If I was gonna remove it, anything, still works in Perl. Yeah. I don't want to use Perl. <laughs> I'm a Rubyist. <laughs> Quit Perl. All right. <laughs> Brian, one feature, what, you have to pick one. Let's say, how about this, one feature from 193, not the 2 stuff. I don't know, Fro okay. frozen. Okay, frozen. Ah, uh, no, 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 okay, I'll tell you. Okay, yeah, hit me. Taint. Yeah, taint, uh, yeah, there we go. And what's the, what's the other one? Trusted? Trusted. Trusted. Yeah. Trusted. 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 What is, what is, what is it? It's, it's not trust. Yes, it's untrust. It's untrust. I never understood yeah. Has yeah. anyone ever used taint or untrust in their own code? No. Absolutely not. No, no. of course. No one. Nobody no one's, does, no one's, does anyone know what taint and untrust actually do? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, 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 maybe if you, these guys maybe if you had previously done Perl, you would kind of have an so, idea for what they were supposed to but do. But safe is going away. Safe is going away, yes. So they are starting so to remove no those little bits. So there's no reason for taint no. anymore, then? So there's no reason for taint anymore, which means nope. taint will go away eventually, too. It is, it is slowly happening. Okay. Good well, question, Eric. Okay, so let's, uh, let, that was a really heavy question. Super heavy. Okay, so who's got some like stump? Does he get a okay. shirt for that? I think. Okay, yeah. <laughs> you can have a sticker. Yeah. Come see me later. Here. here. <laughs> are you a, are you a small? Okay. And now I get to throw I get to throw stuff in an awesome well, theater. Well, back is a t-shirt gun. Oh. Yeah, I get to. Evan's arm. I think we got one back <laughs> here. Okay. Yes. Hello. Um, I'm not sure this is so much uh, stump the implementers, That's okay. but stump myself. <laughs> uh, garbage collection. What the fuck? You guys are happy about the new features that are coming in for like improved of garbage collection, but to me, Ruby is still way behind many other languages when it comes to garbage collection. Mm -hmm. What what do you think to that, and what are you going to do about it? MRI, that? MRI is way behind, not Ruby. Yeah. Well, this is this has been frustrating for us too, because uh, you know, as as new implementations come along uh, and and get mind share and get interest. Uh, they always talk about, oh, we've got concurrency, we've got new garbage collector, and JRuby has been concurrent since 2001, uh, has had awesome garbage collectors since 2001, has had a JIT since 2007 or so. Um, so there are, that's, that's one of the problems that we always fight against, the conflation of Ruby with just MRI, uh, and the fact that, there, that Ruby can do all of these things that people say it can't, if you say Ruby is the language and there's all these different implementations. So. It, it really, it, it's, it's something that we've worked on as far as messaging for years, and we're still not quite there as far as getting the word out. I'll, I'll admit, for Team MRI, we have the worst garbage collector. It's fine. There you <laughs> go. The new one is official. The new one, the new one, the new one is one, awesome. Yeah. The, the new, new one, one is, is awesome. very, very good. Well, very I mean, clever, for yeah. some definition of awesome. It's, it's much more awesome than the last version. <laughs> <laughs> How about this? How about this? It is an engineering marvel. Yes. I will definitely, I will definitely give it engineering marvel. 100. percent Koichi is awesome. Should we guys. talk about what this new garbage collector is? Yeah. You. It sucks that you use Mocha Beery. Oh no. Lies. No, we can fix that. We can well, let's it. actually let's move on okay. because we could get we can Stop get mired okay. down yes. in questions. Yeah, you're right. And I just I just so, wanted to uh, say that uh, Ruby Motion doesn't have a GC. Right. Is the so you know what? Actually, that wins because, <laughs> because because the best code is code that you don't have. Right. So yeah. definitely yeah. Ruby Motion yeah. has the best have GC. A, you have the best GC. You have the best yes. GC. It cannot yes. garbage collect itself. He has absolutely no garbage collection pauses at all. <laughs> yeah. What size uh, shirt do you want? Form of GC, but okay. Uh, and you get who a else? Too. We've got some. I know we've got other ones too. We have someone with the Not mic. Really, yeah. Okay. If you have the mic, just start talking. Uh, so the, the question, the question is about uh, 
uh, another okay. implementation of Ruby, which is not mentioned here, a brand new one, Topaz. So I guess you know about it. Yes. And yeah. uh, one, uh, there's one re really relevant part I found about it. It's about uh, STM, Software Transactional Memory. So uh, do you have plans in other implementations about the, that feature, or are you waiting for uh, the experiment in uh, Topaz to complete uh, before having an opinion? Specifically, this is a question about STM and bringing that to Ruby? Absolutely. Sure. Uh, well, so on the JVM, uh, Clojure has made STM popular. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, actually, in, there is a JRuby extension that you can install that will give you a, uh, a Clojure colon colon object that you can extend. And then you have transactional memory uh, instance variables. So all of your modifications have to be done in a do sync block. Otherwise, they raise. It's guaranteed that threads are going to see things in the right order. Um, so we've, we've done experiments with bringing Clojure's STM to JRuby already. The main reason that it's not just a feature or, or a gem you can install is because tracking which Clojure version to ship and, and when we want to ship it, um, we haven't done that yet. But it, it's certainly possible for us to take advantage of other STMs that are already on the JVM. Thoughts on STM, boys? <laughs> Actually, uh, Aaron thinks that STM stands for Sausage Transactional Mouth. <laughs> so how, how, how many pieces of sausage can he fit in his mouth before he has to swallow many. them? <laughs> yeah. It's a one-to-end. Uh, <laughs> I, I think it's a good experiment. I, I mean, I, I don't think that there, there are some problems with STM. It's definitely not something you can just use generically, right? Obviously, uh, you can't unfire missiles. So you, you have to actually structure your code well to use it. Um, it's interesting. I mean, if someone really desperately wanted it, I'd be happy to look at implementing it. Yeah. Um, what size shirt do you want? Okay. It's, a, it's also, other, we, can, okay. I, can I say yeah, one more thing? Go ahead, continue. So, you can uh, watch me. STM is one of the things that people use to try to manage concurrency. There is a lot of things that are simpler. You can probably model a lot of data using a concurrent lock-free data structure instead of necessarily trying to mutate state and control it that way. So it's one of many things. And I think that if we address the fact that we need concurrency, then we'll start getting more creative and innovate on the data structures we provide. Clojure is fantastic because it provides really cool data structures, more so than it's a particular language that's interesting, I think. Well, I, I, this is an interesting uh, distinction to make. STM use in Clojure is almost exclusively to uh, control your interaction with mutable objects and mutable part of the world, which is the bad part. You're supposed to keep that over here in a box in your do sync. Uh, whereas the STM that they're talking about for PyPy is basically for all sorts of mutable state, like the entire system, uh, the code that it generates. They want to do STM for all of these things. And, you know, I'm sure the truth lies in the middle somewhere. STM is probably more useful uh, in a general way than Clojure gives it. But I don't think your entire memory model should be based exclusively on software transactional memory. I don't see that that's ever going to work right. Unless you're already, if you, unless you start immutable. Like, you know, like in Haskell, where yeah. you're like, all right, I'm already immutable. Right, right. I so can't fire missiles, so everything's good. <laughs> That's exactly. Sure. Missiles tend to have side effects. Yeah, yeah missiles have definitely have side effects. <laughs> okay, so who has, who has a stump question? We haven't got any of these yet. So, so if I understand it correctly, the stump questions, I can quiz you on your Ruby knowledge? Yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah. Okay, so one thing I don't really get is why all the talk about frozen string syntax, because Ruby already has that. Ruby, even Ruby 1.8 has a syntax for, for a frozen string. string literals that will reuse the same object. Oh, I know. And that. I was wondering if you know which syntax that is. I do, yes. <laughs> okay. Go All ahead. Right. We'll go no, ahead. no, no. Have you you defeated it? No. I, 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 he's getting a t-shirt anyway, because I don't know it. To Us? sim? No, well, no, no, no. 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 Is there a, is there a, 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 a... You're talking about the thing that Charlie wrote, right? Yes. Uh, yeah. Is there a percent uh, dealing, Bob? That's what I was saying, yeah. Is no. there like a percent? No. F, 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 Give F. him his t-shirt. It's shorter. You all yeah. suck. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's backtick. Yes, it's yeah. a backtick. So the backtick is a method that you can define, and it oh, gets a oh. string, uh, string object pass, and it gets the same string object oh. all the time, and oh, it's frozen. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. oh. it's like an interpolated string almost. I guess that makes sense yeah. that it would be frozen, and we'd always get the same one. So if you already want, if you want something like the frozen string syntax, you can redefine the backtick method in your class 
to just return the argument. It's Please email the list about that. That's the best suggestion thus far. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what size shirt do you want? Uh, medium. Who, el who else has a good With, the, a with good the nice side effect that if you happen to miss redefining it, you'll just you'll go and just system run that some string. command. That's amazing. Which That's possibly awesome. Be That's a security, amazing. Security like, threat. Like you, and Constantine gave a talk about security threats. Back tick. <laughs> oh my. Back tick fire <laughs> yeah. hyphen missiles. Did I? Yes. Did I <laughs> no, you want you want the back tick. You wanted the frozen string. Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is the new TD. It's trap door driven development. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. New TDD. Any other any other uh, stumpers or whatever? Let's see. What time? Development. TDD. TDD. Door driven. All right. It's five thirty. So we've got like another you know twenty ish minutes. So we've got a few more questions, right? Okay. So we've got some at the top. I don't know if there's a mic up there. Mike's here. Mike's. Oh man, look at this. Wow. You got to give that. Give him a hand. Come on. Look at. That was amazing. Wow. I know who's on the French uh, uh, Olympics team now. <laughs> okay, okay, so this is this might be too easy, but also a little stump question. Um, if your system's locale is set to Japanese, and you have a string literal with um, Japanese characters containing some string interpolation, and you're interpolating a UDF-8 string in there containing Japanese characters, <laughs> what's going to happen? Boom! Ah! <laughs> No, I don't know. Well, it's, not, it's, it's encoding inception at that point. Is the locale EUCJP or shift yeah. Yes. yeah, right. Yeah. yeah, that's the locale. Which uh, one? Which one? And what, <laughs> what about the, the first one? Magic, uh, EU, EUCJP. EUCJP EU or shift just EUC. He said the first EUC. EUC. Oh, EUCJP. I yeah. think that one's okay. I think it'll translate. And UTF-8 will go to. UTF-8? Yeah. Yeah. It'll most, of, most of the encodings are, are compatible. Not shift just. Shift just. Not shift just is like yeah. the main one. But most of the other ones do. So. <laughs> now you see why Brian doesn't like encodings. Yeah. <laughs> Trivia. Trivia. All right, you get a t-shirt, but I can't throw it up okay, there. Okay, thanks. Uh, and they definitely wouldn't let me have a t-shirt cannon with that in here. Yeah, no so, kidding. So just come down later. I'll put one aside. So you'd end up you with, want, a, you'd you end up with a shift or, or an EUCJP yeah. string. Yeah, so if it's shift jizz, it would blow up. Would is, blow that up. The, is that yep. the deal, Bob? It, All right. It could, right? It wouldn't necessarily. It depends yeah. on the characters. Or does it automatically? Well, no, I think it's shift jizz. Yeah, it's incompatible. Incompatible. Yeah, I think shift jizz is incompatible. Um, OK, let's, I think we have time example. for one more. Do we have, do we have <laughs> any, any more in the house? I just want to say that. OK, yes, oh, over here. On the second level On the there. second level. Yes. Over there. We got one there. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. Was there one on the first? We haven't hit. We haven't hit Somebody the mezzanine tier him. yet. Should we? Should we, we should at least give mezzanine tier one. We should ask Rails questions too. Yeah. Uh, hi. Yeah, uh, <laughs> you, oh yeah. You asked Charlie yeah. a Rails question. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, it's not a stem question, but um, I'd like to know when you came to your own uh, to your specific Ruby implementation, uh, what part of it uh, gave you the most, the biggest wow effect? You know, the most. Uh, Significant part of the implementation that uh, gave you these, um, you know, just a wow effect. That that's just amazing. This part here is just amazing. Well, I, for for JRuby, I think it would probably be the the wow factor for most folks that come to the to come to JRuby. It's that everything on the JVM is just available as if it were a Ruby library. I mean, all, all the language, languages that are out there, all the libraries that are available, everything that's been written over the past 20 years for the JVM, you can load into a piece of Ruby code and call it as if it was a Ruby library. And that was, um, that was definitely what drew me to it and got me excited about it, the, the ability to have Ruby with all of these really mature libraries for everything from, uh, from network I.O. to concurrency just available. And I, I, that was a big moment for me to, to see that. Keep talking. For, okay. for me, oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry, yeah. yeah. For me, the big wow moment is actually uh, watching people writing iPhone apps in Ruby and shipping them on the App Store. And then these apps are picked by newspapers and television and whatever. And people don't know they are written in Ruby. Yeah. Mm. They just use the, the app. And Do you have a page that shows like all the apps? Yeah. That are, that's awesome. Yeah, we have a page. I think that, and recently, we have this app called uh, Front Back. Um, name one thing that you wish your implementation did better. So this is sort of saying, like, what kind of features would you like? What kind of things you're like, eh, whatever, you know. 
Uh, let's start with Charlie. <laughs> you, can be, you can be Aaron for this question. <clears throat> what, what do you wish MRI did better? I'm trying to think of what I wish JRuby would do better. <laughs> so, so the thing that I wish that would be better is startup time. It's way too slow right now. I try to start it up, and I'm like, I'm trying to run my scripts with my global variables on the command line. Yeah. It's just like. <laughs> when, you're, when you were using JRuby as an awk replacement. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. It's a little too slow on the startup. <laughs> OK. All right, OK. Slow startup. So you wish the startup was a little yeah, faster. Yeah, I, I wish the startup was a little bit faster. But other than that, I'm, I'm pretty happy with it. Laurent, what about you about Ruby Motion? <laughs> <laughs> you can be, you can do JRuby again if you want. He's too, Should he's, I do MRI? He's I'll too do good. MRI. Yeah, do I don't a, know. Do, do MRI. Do okay, MRI. okay. Well, if it, okay. So um, probably Aaron will agree with me, but the best thing that <laughs> MRI should do is like MRI really needs a better garbage collector. If we had a better garbage collector, then we can do stuff like well. The other thing that Aaron probably wishes, right, <laughs> is that we had a JIT. That would be nice. Yeah, the JIT would be nice. OK. So w w you, you can talk about JRuby if you want. Or you can talk about Ruby motion, whatever you want at this point. Well, let's see. Uh, so like, like Charlie said, uh, the startup time issue is a big problem for JRuby. And it's something that's very difficult for any managed JIT runtime to solve. I, I know of none that have an actual runtime JIT and mostly managed code that have solved this in any, any significant way. Even for, for the fastest ones like PyPy, the primary complaint is still startup time. So it's, it's a problem that I don't know if we have a, a near-term solution for. Uh, I think my biggest frustration with JRuby is that we haven't found, and, and there may be no solution to the C extension issue. Uh, we have added, we added a C extension a, uh, API that sort of worked, and it it's sort of made some extensions run right, but it was totally incompatible with doing concurrency that we want to be able to do on the JVM, uh, totally incompatible with having multiple JRuby instances running in a given server, which opens up a lot of possibilities. Um, so I wish there was a way that we could solve that, but I, I don't know of anything that we're going to be able to do until the C API changes. Is that, is that really a priority, though? I mean. Well, it's it's only a priority in as much as who wishes he uh, had it. I mean, that was a question. That's kind yeah, of I it. wish we could just transparently run C extensions and have them not limit the system, uh, like they 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 kind of inherently do. Um, but it's it's become less and less of a problem as people have actually ported libraries over to have equivalent versions, uh, or just using a completely different library, um, maybe with an API wrapper around it. So that's probably the biggest thing for us. Air Laurent? Yeah. Air Laurent? I actually don't know much about Ruby Motion. Uh, I use it once to write an app to, uh, <laughs> to actually uh, uh, maintain my sausage uh, factory. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it has, the memory, uh, memory model of Ruby Motion is pretty sucky. I mean, it, it works, it's very basic, but there are so many things we could do. Uh, just recently, uh, the, Remo the Ruby Motion team added, thank you. <laughs> uh, cycle detection, so if actually, yeah, it can actually detect cyclic references and release them, which is nice, but uh, it's actually very um, primitive, and there are so many, there are so many edge cases, and they, pr they probably want to write to GC at some point, but. But then, but then it won't be the best, just so you know. Yeah. If you don't have one, you're still the best. Yeah, the thing is that we're, 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 there are so many constraints on iOS, and it's very tough yeah. to find the best recipe. When, as successive releases of iOS and iPhones come out, does it? Do you just feel like, oh, good, I don't have to do that now? Because you know, like the, the the phone's faster, or the they've got more memory, or whatever. They are, they are, yeah, definitely, yeah. The, the hardware is getting better, and what's super interesting now is the new iPhone 5S as a 64-bit processor, and there are so many things we can do with that uh, on the runtime. I mean, we can use. Um, better tag, tag pointers. We can tag much more information. So we have a larger fixed num and float range. And also, uh, in the 64-bit version of iOS, uh, it uses C++ exceptions by default. Oh, really? So it doesn't use set gem, not gem anymore. Mm -hmm. On 32-bit iOS, it uses set gem, not gem, yeah. which is a very, uh, a very inefficient way of doing exception handling. And on 64-bit, it uses uh, the C++ ABI, which means that the try uh, blogs are uh, zero cost; they cost nothing. So, cool. and Ruby Motion benefits from that. Yeah. Brian, 
So for Venice, let's see. Uh, so something I, I wish I did better. Yeah, something you wish I did better. Hmm. <laughs> no, I, I, I kid. Uh, I'm not being modest. Uh, we do have a pretty good startup. It takes us about a third of a second, so we're managed runtime. I have some stuff that uh, is going to fix that, but I do want that to be faster. MRI starts up in like 0 0.01 of a second. Um, the biggest thing that I want to do better is concurrency. I uh, recently read a paper on MIO, the new Haskell uh, IO manager, and they're able to get scaling on 40 cores up to like 600,000 requests per second. Who would like to have 600,000 requests per second? I would. Um, and they did that by doing some pretty, pretty cool stuff by taking a single IO manager and, and splitting that out. So that's concurrency is the number one thing that I want to make super good in Rubinis. Not going to be able to do the next Facebook without. 42 cores. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, you um, kid. <laughs> okay, so um, let's see. Um, okay, we'll skip a couple of these when we come back to them. Um, what do you think is a big unsolved problem in Ruby? So it's a, you know, like you're talking with users, um, seeing what, you know, what you'd like to be able to give them that you just can't figure out how to do, or it, the, the, backwards compatibility limits you, or whatever it might be. What do you think is one of these big sort of unsolved things that we haven't, we haven't gotten to yet, or we haven't figured out how to do yet? Any thoughts there? I well, think, oh, go ahead. Well, I, 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 I think a lot of us will agree that um, one of the biggest ones is the fact that uh, concurrency has never really been addressed as a core Ruby concept. Um, because MRI is not parallel threaded, it doesn't have actual parallel execution, and it's not going to. I mean, I don't see that ever happening. Moss has said MRI is never going to have parallel threading. Right. So it's up to us on the other implementations to kind of lead the way. And um, we've tried to do that with JRuby, getting some libraries out there like ThreadSafe Jam, the Atomic Jam, uh, to give ThreadSafe utilities to Ruby users so that they'll have the right tools to build concurrent applications. Um, but you know, we we st I'm, and we still need to do more in MRI and the standard library. Um, there's a, I've got a feature request to add a new version of uh, Delegator uh, in the delegate.rb library that basically you can wrap any object with uh, monitors. All the calls will then go through a monitor or a mutex uh, so that you can, if you've got an API that has threading problems and you need to be able to use it in a concurrent scenario, at least you can lock it down. And it's fairly common in other platforms that have concurrency yeah. that there's a way to wrap it in a secure, synchronized wrapper. Um, but more and more little utilities, getting uh, thread safe caching and whatnot into core uh, would be great. Um, the other one I, I already talked about, uh, the, the number one thing that's holding C Ruby back, and by extension holding Ruby back, is the C API. Um, the C API is far too invasive. Uh, it, it imposes all sorts of requirements on the runtimes that implement it. It is impossible for uh, most managed runtimes to implement it 100%. There are things that you just cannot do. Uh, if you have uh, a GC that moves objects, for example. It's, it's, it needs to improve, it needs to change at some point, and I think it's probably going to be the most difficult thing to change because of the volume of extensions that are out there. Well, we are, and, I mean, we are changing it with 2.1. Well, changing it how, though? Uh, so if you, like, basically the sh sunny, shady split. Right. So like, if you use stuff thing? that's, like, bad news, bears, functions, then we're like, no, sorry, you're a shady, you're a shady object, we can't move you around. Right, I right. Mean, I think it's getting there. It's just very, very slow. Right. Well, the example that I would use is uh, MRuby's C API as a comparison. MRuby's C API. MRuby is, is Mots's current project to do a, a small footprint embedded Ruby for, for embedded devices. Uh, and the MRuby C API, you get passed into every object a context that represents the runtime that you're working with, and all the state goes there rather than in C globals, a major problem for making MRI concurrent or uh, doing any uh, uh, more advanced GC concepts. Uh, more like, it's more like JNI in that regard, the Java native extension interface. Um, I would love to see MRuby's C API be the direction that Ruby's C API goes in the future, allow having more isolation between these extensions people write and the internals of whatever VM it's on. It's not that I don't like C-based extensions. I think they're, an, they're a necessity. The JVM has a bunch of C-based extensions for integrating with uh, operating system level features. What the problem is, it's, it's the C API as it's designed today. 
and how it exposes way too much of the internals of MRI. It's not, it's not actually an API and it's not designed. It's all the C functions that implement MRI and they're all available by the way that you can link anything against a C object file. And that's the thing that's challenging. So MRI needs a particular C function because they're implemented in C. They write the C function. Someone else reads the C code and says, that does exactly what I want. They use that in their C extension and now that becomes a de facto C API. Then they try to run the extension somewhere else and we have to provide that function, even if it is meaningless to us, or if it does really crazy things, possibly, in C. So that's, that's the big challenge. It's not an API. The MRuby API, J and I are, are things that were actually more designed, so. Well, okay. Any other thoughts there? That's a good one. I mean, clearly that's. I think one of the ways that Ruby is, is failing developers is that um, we do not have good tooling around it. We, if, uh, so I, I fixed a bug um, where, um, there is a framework that def defined clear on the string. And of course, clear is a method that's defined on string that removes the contents of the string. In their case, uh, clear was being defined as a set of ANSI uh, escape codes for the shell, and clear was something to take off a color, right? So it had red, blue, green, and clear. Mm -hmm. And Rubinius, in the core library, which is written in Ruby, used sh some string.clear, and that was being sent to file expand path, and then so require was trying to <laughs> require a thing that had ANSI escape sequences on it. And I was in, in the C code with a debugger going, how did we screw up? concatenating strings, right? How did this happen? It had nothing to do with that. It was, wow. it was clear up there in, in, in Ruby land. So I think that being able to get a picture of Ruby code that's running, we take a bunch of files, we require them somewhere, and then we run some code, stuff happens, and we go, whoa, what happened? And then you go into a debugger and you try to find your way around. It would be really nice if I could have just said, what method did I just call on that? Oh, it was something way over here. And I eventually found that by getting a backtrace in the C plus plus V <laughs> told me which Ruby method I was actually coming from. And I was like, what? So I, I think that that's one place that we need to, we need to help Ruby. Yeah. I'm probably a really terrible, horrible debugger, but doing method and source location would have told I had you. no reason to suspect clear is what I'm saying. It was, uh -huh. a, it was a trap door. Yeah. yeah. So somewhere along the line that, that string was turned into an ANSI escape sequence and <laughs> <laughs> no idea where. Um, so I have written down here, what kind of code is the fastest code? And this is something that was always, Charlie and I did a talk years ago now called like the dark corners of Ruby where we talk about like this construct is really slow and this one's really fast, whatever. I've I kind don't of, remember that at all. You weren't, oh, okay, oh, that's right. Yeah, you were, <laughs> no you were hammered at the time. That's why <laughs> totally just, just trashed. Um, so uh, what, you know, any, you know, I, one question I think that, the reason I wrote this down was because people will ask like, okay, well, you know, like I want to, right now I've got my, my thing, I want to write code that's fast. I want, my, I want my, meth, my things to be as fast as they can be. So what, what should it look like? What, should, what methods should I avoid? What kind of construct should I use? You know, like, you guys could talk about that. Just any, anything that comes to mind on that topic. I, my, I, my general rule of thumb is that no code is faster than no code. You stole that. Yeah. <laughs> and it also has no bugs. Yes. Yeah. It, just it, like, just like. Um, so don't write Ron's GC. <laughs> yes. So, so what you're saying is, if you wake up in the morning, and you just make saucy song all day, you've written then, the fastest code on earth. Yeah, and you go to bed, you've written the best code possible in the day. That's what you're saying. Yes. Let's say you have to write some code, though. So let's say. You're paid by the line? You're paid. <laughs> no, 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 no. Let's say that the sausage isn't going to measure its own temperature. So you got to write a Twitter bot now to, to tweet out its temperature. Naturally. Who, naturally. Simple, as, simple, as simple code do. tends to be pretty fast. Not, yeah. you know. I, so think it, I think it reads. So there are so many things. I think people are just abuse of so many things in Ruby because Ruby is such a concise language and you can do a lot of crazy things. And they don't realize how much runtime. Uh, power they actually use on the, sometimes just on a single line. For example, uh, in Ruby, um, you should avoid creating too many temporary objects. People just link, for example, select, then map, then inject, then whatever, and they could have just used one method. It would have been maybe three or four lines, but it would be way faster. And also, people abuse of creating one-line methods. In the purpose of refactoring, they, they like to destroy a, a very large method into a different small ones, 
But what's going to happen is that it's going to do, um, it's going to be one more call to the dispatcher at runtime. So it's going to be slower than having all this code in line into one. Well, of course, I, of course, so that there are obviously implementation details. Yeah. Jerry be my right, or right. Ruby my start on, on, um, That that's I would I would say you need to go the other direction. You should have methods that are small and do one thing. Mm. Uh, and the problem that we've run into with Ruby is that sometimes methods are so large and, and inline so much code that like the JVM won't even compile it anymore. It gives up. Once it's it so big. Code, it's it's the complexity right of this method is so far beyond what it will even tackle. Right. It's like, whatever, dude. I'm not even touching that code. Is it still, is it <laughs> I don't even, I can't even see through this. Is it I'm still 64K, the max number of bytecode? The, that's just the max number of bytecodes, but the JIT itself actually has like complexity yeah, oh, yeah, and so no, size yeah, yeah, metrics yeah, yeah. that it will bail out on. Um, and we've run into that with like, like date formatting, the method was just oh, yeah. way too large, yeah. and the JVM just was like never compiling it. It just was running it interpreted in JRuby on a JVM that was only interpreting our interpreter, and it was, you know, terribly slow. Uh, the the memory thing. Uh, I, every time someone says, "How can I make my code faster?" Allocate fewer objects. Yeah. Bottom line, um, the number one bottleneck on any system today, and probably for the foreseeable future, is the memory pipeline. Uh, m almost every performance issue that we have reported to JRuby, uh, if it, unless it's like a, an obvious egregious bug in our code somewhere, it's uh, allocation. And you will get by far the biggest bang for your buck by reducing how many transient objects you're creating uh, and, and trying to be a little bit more, a little smarter about how you're allocating stuff. Uh, and this also plays into what Brian was saying about tooling. Uh, tooling for CRuby to see all the objects you're allocating has been traditionally not very strong. Um, Rubinius has tools, JRuby has tools. There are some that work with different versions of CRuby. It's kind of mix and match. Uh, but yeah, 2.1 has some tools for doing this as well. So that's coming along. But definitely, number one thing, if you want faster code, allocate fewer objects. Speaking, putting on my Rails core hat, yeah. um, we like to do, so one thing that we do a lot for speed in Rails is to um, take object instances and extend modules onto them a lot, and then also like eval tons of things. Mm, yes. That? Yeah, no, that's, that's not great either. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think we've reached the end, oh. as it were, my friends. Um, I want to thank our panel uh, for coming all the way out to France uh, and talking with you. I know, Laurent, I know it was a long trip, buddy. Oh, yeah. I know it was a long, <laughs> long trip. I had to take the boat. Yeah, <laughs> he had to take, he, he took a boat here, people. Um, so thank you for coming. Uh, let's give them a round of applause, please. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah, you have to